are um, published, but others we are in the process of writing it up. But uh, I think uh, science is for exchange, so um, I think we should uh, be open, and uh, um, and that's why I'm quite happy to uh, <coughs> to share share the um, the video with you. So. Um, okay, so my talk is about uh, spectral imaging, but let me, um, if, if I can, um, give you an introduction to the lab. Um, we are Imaging and Sensing for Archaeology, Art History and Conservation, Isaac Lab. Um, we are mostly physicists, so Isaac seems a um, appropriate name for it. And what do we do? We are engaged in uh, developing new instruments and data science methods tailored to cultural heritage research. And uh, we, um, uh, but of course, uh, just developing inst uh, instrument and methods uh, is not enough. And also you cannot develop them well unless you are engaged in applications. And we are very interested in applications, of course. So we also engage in applications, uh, collaborating with conservators, historians, and uh, uh, Museum, uh, museums, and so on, and uh, uh, you know uh, the, the the kind of instruments we have been developing lately are related to different kind of spectral imaging uh, systems, uh, optical coherence tomography, uh, different types of uh, OCTs, and uh, also uh, remote sensing. So. Um, uh, taking spectroscopy from distance of 10 meters, for example, remote Raman, uh, remote uh, laser induced breakdown spectroscopy, etc. And uh, so we are on the ground floor laboratory here. Uh, optics has to be on the ground floor. And outside, just outside our lab, here is uh, everybody um, uh, gathered together um, our research fellows and PhD students, and so on. So um, I often get asked, why do you bother building instruments and write new software? But from the talks you've seen today, you probably got an idea why. Um, basically, um, instruments and methods need to be tailored to cultural heritage applications. Direct transfer of technology from, say, for example, from biomedical uh, um, imaging or whatever, um, doesn't always work. Um, and uh, heritage applications tend to be the most uh, challenging and demanding because heritage materials are the most diverse and heterogeneous. And uh, it's, um, you know, you might say, well, well let's get a commercial, um, you know, a, a company to do it all. But unfortunately, a heritage market is small and may not always be of interest to them. And also, if you build an instrument and develop a method, every time when the next problem comes along, you always want to change it to fit the next problem. And if you have in-house developed instrument or software, it is much more versatile. And finally, like a lot of developed uh, um, disciplines, the research facilities, you know, infrastructures, you know, uh, instruments, um, software needs to be developed within the community to fit our needs. And that is always a sign of a mature um, discipline. So we're moving towards that, as we've seen from today's talk so far. And uh, so uh, just to say that uh, uh, we realize, uh, we don't have to say very much now because everybody realized that uh, we are at a university, we don't have a collection. So in order to go to have access to, to objects and so on and the monuments, we need to make all everything we build mobile. So that's always in our mind when we develop new instruments, we have to make them mobile. And uh, um, so we develop instruments that can categorize them into spectroscopy, imaging, and of course, imaging, uh, spectral imaging is a combination of the two, and that can give you a material identification um, to help with conservation treatment, art history, archaeology work, and also the imaging would always be very good documentation. And uh, they can help with the end products here uh, where we can do interdisciplinary research. Um, <clears throat> and of course, sometimes we find the new instruments we build are uh, of interest to 
other dis academic disciplines uh, such as soft, soft matter physics, such as uh, the, uh, industry sometimes. Um, and we are happy to uh, work with them, although we don't seek uh, necessarily to go in those directions, but they come our way. It just demonstrates how working for heritage science can have other benefits too. Um, okay, so we also have uh, in the last few years uh, starting put together all our instruments and complement them with some commercial uh, common instruments together to make Isaac mobile lab and uh, uh, so that we can take it in a van to go to places. And these are the different categories of uh, instruments we have. And if you have the chance, visit our website to see what we are doing. Uh, we have a number of case studies as well as all the instruments and techniques there. And uh, we not only take it around Europe, but uh, we've also been around the world. And the first is, furthest we've been is New Zealand. Now I'll show you an example of something we've done there. Um, and so, uh, so the, the, there's uh, lots of uh, interesting stories I can tell you about the challenges of moving instruments around the world, customs and all that. And finally, um, uh, the other aspects of, of my talk is about data processing method and machine learning and all that. And as you know, in Imperial HS, we are talking about in the future, what would DigiLab be? And in that, uh, you know, we are championing, of course, it's not just database, but also providing data analysis tools. I will start doing that through three um, nationally funded and bilaterally funded projects um, where the aim is to develop you know, in, uh, first of first to develop a um, uh, DigiLab tool for data analysis to analyze spectral imaging data um, and uh, also that in com combination with our mobile lab and the DigiLab data processing together we can reduce barriers uh, of ex uh, you know ba barriers to uh, of access to um, expertise and scientific instruments and uh, so we can bring the latest instrument we build and the latest software build and share it with the community and uh, uh, this is happening now with uh, and we'll probably be releasing this uh, the software um, on our website for people to upload their data for us to process uh, probably uh, later this year and uh, so um, so anyway, I will come back to this uh, later and we'll get on to the topic that is uh, what is spectral imaging, first of all. Um, so spectral imaging sometimes is called imaging spectroscopy. And I would say the broad definition is any imaging method that gives you 2D spatial information plus a third dimension, which can be, uh, which is in a spectral direction, either wavelength, frequency or energy. And uh, and uh, basically you have space that end up with a spatially continuous set of spectra like these. <coughs> so you see the image and you have the spectra at every pixel. And so we tend to call these uh, uh, data cubes or image cube. And uh, I'm just giving you three examples. Um, it could be reflectance, uh, spectra, uh, a series of re reflectance spectra together to give you a, um, a UVVs reflectance uh, spectra imaging data cube. Uh, you can have um, um, uh, an X-ray fluorescence data cube as uh, uh, Paolo has shown earlier, and you can also have FTIR spectra data cube. I'm sure somebody else has showed it already. So, you know, you can offer all these axes give you spectra information. And uh, so, so in my talk, I think I'm going to focus because there's so much to talk about. So I'm just going to focus on reflectance spectra imaging mostly. Um, so spectra imaging, there's a bit of a confusion in names. Uh, includes multispectral and hyperspectral imaging. Um, uh, and uh, but these are very artificial, really. Uh, it used to be that people say, uh, if it is uh, 10 bands or less, we call it multispectral. If it's, uh, I don't know, more than 20 bands, it's hyperspectral or whatever. But these are artificial terms, and I prefer not to use them and stick with just spectral imaging. 
Um, uh, because multispectral imaging is a very confused term amongst the conservation community. Um, it doesn't always mean reflectance spectra. It can be RGB plus when infrared and plus UV fluorescence. So that's a totally different modality, but you put them together. And that's not going to give you reflectance spectra. So it, it's a, so that's why I've stopped using multispectral imaging because it could mean all kinds of things. And rather we say spectral imaging to include, you know, it doesn't matter 10 band, 20 band, 100 band. Also, we call it spectral imaging. And reflectance is a percentage of light reflected back from the sample. So for example, this is one that uh, 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 a detail from a painting from the National Gallery. And if you look at through different sector bands, uh, you see that uh, uh, by the time you go to the near infrared, you're starting to see things that you do not see with your naked eye. Here's a color picture. And uh, you can also line them up to make the cube. So every pixel, so in this case, for example, I have uh, 13 bands. So this pixel is going to have 13 values co corresponding to 13 wavelengths. And the reflectance spectra can give you, um, uh, can be compared to reference uh, spectra, and in this case will be identified with azurite, for example. And, uh, and by the way, all the hardware and, uh, you know, up or, and everything about um, spectral imaging up to 2012. Uh, you can see a review article of mine here um, if you if you want to look into more detail and the following few slides will be uh, directly related to that. And so what are, there are types of spectral imaging. Um, so you can either, so let's say this is a painting, you have illumination and reflected light is gathered by a camera, but you have a filtering system, let's say. So it's a wavelength selection on the detector side. You can do it that way. So you can change what light you image here uh, by selecting the, the wavelength band, or you can actually put this filtering device to select um, the, the wavelengths on the illumination side. And people do that, for example, also using narrowband light like LED. So many uh, libraries use Megavision, for example, is a set of LEDs. So it's wavelength selection on the illumination side. Um, where um, this kind of device is easier to build, well, hmm, depends. <laughs> it just means that there's less demand on what you do with the lens of the camera, that's all. And there, there's also its own challenges as well, which I'm not going to go into uh, right now. And uh, you can do simultaneous spatial uh, information gathering by sequential spectral imaging. So for example, with a filter wheel that turns around and you put it in front of the camera, that is the most common way. And then you gather all your uh, different bands and make a spectral cube. Uh, the other way is to do simultaneous spectral uh, collection by sequential spatial imaging. So what do I mean by that? So then it's a system that uh, usually on the market, most of the system you buy today, uh, they call hyperspectral imaging are these kind of devices. You have the lens at the front and then you have the most important part of this device that is a spectrograph and that's a detector, the camera. Okay, what's in the spectrograph? You have a slit, you have a, a grating system that disperses light into different wavelengths and you probably need some other Rayleigh optics, uh, Rayleigh optics, uh, including order sorting filters and so on, just, just because they want to have a compact system. So what you see instantaneously, you gather an image like this. So you have one column spatially, and then each point on that column, you have a, uh, you have a spectrum. So you have rows of spectrums collected of one spatial column. And in order to get a, 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 a spectra um, image cube, you have to scan spatially. So you can uh, scan by moving the whole system, or in some cases, there is a micro mirror inside that scans. So either way, this is where you see instantaneous is only after you gather the cube, you cut it the other way, that do you see the image, okay? So it's perhaps less intuitive instantaneously. And, uh, there are pros and cons between filter-based and grating-based systems. Um, filter-based has low demand in optics, 
uh, it's easy to get a lens that would be achromatic over a narrow spectral band, meaning that all light uh, coming through will be focused. And one of the problems a lot of you may have encountered, this is when you get uh, uh, um, you know, commercial device into your lab trying to image a painting, uh, where there's no appropriate optics that would focus everything from 400 nanometers to 1000 nanometers. Uh, so it has high demand on optics. You have to get uh, a very specialized optics to, so that all the light within your spectra band will be focused together. So that's one of the demands. You need an expensive lens if you use a grating system, grating based system. And the filter system, you can adjust your uh, exposure time filter by filter and achieve optimum signal to noise ratio per band um, uh, all the time. But with grating based system, you receive all the light on the CCD detector at once. So this is much more difficult to organize. Um, so filters are a natural choice for, okay, I'm using multi spectrum. I said I wasn't going to use it. Okay, it's a natural choice where you only need low resolution spectral imaging. Whereas grating based system is if you need the very high resolution. Uh, spectral resolution, then you want to go grating based. And the other thing with filters is that you do not collect a spectrum like that instantaneously. You, so therefore, it's not good for fast changing uh, situations. For example, if you're imaging under daylight, where the clouds are coming in and out, uh, you want to get a spectrum that looks like what it should be because of that. So grating based system, because it gets at least with one spatial line, all the spectrum in one go, the spectrum will be correct. So these are the uh, pros and cons when you're trying to decide which way to go. And OK, so as we were talking about, uh, you know, maybe sometimes deciding factor spectral resolution. So there is a misconception and sometimes uh, um, uh, salespeople will try to impress you by saying that I have this hyperspectral imaging system, the resolution is one nanometers, whereas the other system, the resolution is 10 nanometers, therefore mine is better and more expensive, and you should get mine. That's not necessarily true. Um, because, okay, first of all, spectral resolution depends on two things, intrinsic resolution of your spectrograph, and um, determined by the optics um, in, in, a, uh, in your spectrograph, and uh, and also, it depends on sampling, uh, sampling interval, that is uh, the number of pixels uh, on your detector. Okay. And mo but you have to remember, most natural material have fairly smooth spectra. You know, if you're talk talking about paintings, most pigments don't have very uh, sharp uh, spe um, spectral bands. Uh, maybe some dyes have that, and maybe cobalt pigments have, have uh, uh, needs higher resolution. But in general, uh, you would be able to cover most material, um, even with resolutions of 50 nanometers. Um, if you want to cover everything, um, 10 nanometer spectral resolution, 5 nanometer sampling interval is all you need. And here are some simulations. So this is a high resolution using a high resolution uh, um, uh, spectrometer uh, that gives you this spectrum for, uh, I think in this case, a lac dye. And then what you can do, you can smooth it, smoothing window to smooth it down. So this is telling you about the, as I said, the intrinsic resolution. So even to 30 nanometers, you can just about see the two bands, but not very well. So probably 25 nanometers, but I have not changed my sampling interval. On the other hand, if I do not smooth it and simply change my sampling interval from one nanometers to five and 20 nanometer, this is what it's going to look like. And so in combination, we find that 10 nanometer resolution, 5 nanometer sampling will cover you for this kind of acylcanone dyes. Um, so just to give you an idea that you actually don't need very high. And for majority pigment, apart from a handful of these pigments, uh, even 50 nanometer resolution is OK. And uh, uh, because, OK, you might say that, oh, well, if I can afford it, I, I will have just high spectral resolution always. That's not necessarily true because you may not be able to afford the time. Higher spectral resolution means longer exposure time. 
and lower signal noise for the same exposure, or, or that uh, you, if you if you use the same time, uh, then you may get lower signal to noise. Of course, you can bin it uh, to in improve it, but then you've lost your high resolution, right? Um, the other thing is about spatial resolution. Spatial resolution is uh, imaging, and it really depends on your application, what kind of spatial resolution you want. But one thing I do want to warn people is that it's not just about the detector, that I've got, uh, I don't know, 10 megapixel, therefore it's much better than the one megapixel camera, not necessarily, because uh, uh, the spatial resolution is governed not just by sampling interval given by the number of pixels, you know, um, uh, but also the optical resolution given by your optics. So um, th there's no point buying a, a, a 10 megapixel camera when you have a very bad lens. Okay, spectral range. Um, usually we go from UV vis to, um, you know, in this range, silicon CCD detectors are good and they usually have characteristic spectral features of colorants. And uh, uh, you can go to the short wave infrared or the chemistal core it near infrared, um, and uh, and uh, that's from one micron, two point five microns, and you can use there are different detectors suitable for that. And usually for the uh, for the longer wavelengths, um, uh, indium gall gallium arsenide is not so good, and you probably use uh, MCT or indium antimony detectors. And uh, they give you additional spectral features for colorants, in particular distinguishing different kind of white pigments, for example, binding medium, moisture, etc. And of course, you can also go to the midi infrared. Uh, so I'm talking chemist term because I know there's lots of chemists here, and we can call mid wave infrared, long wave infrared. And uh, there, the detector in, uh, in, in, in this uh, are the uh, um, mostly um, the good detector and MCTs. And that gives you the various molecular bounding FTIR range that all chemists know about. Okay, so um, once we get spectral images, well, people say they find it very daunting what to do with spectral images, but actually um, the calibration procedure is very similar to that for reflectance spectroscopy. Uh, first of all, you need to subtract what we call the dark current um, because the, um, the detector at a temperature um, uh, would always be at a particular temperature and the higher the temperature is, the more likely that uh, one of the valence electrons will gather enough energy to jump into conduction banner be detected. So even if so, that has nothing to do with incident photons, and that's just for dark subtraction. So you 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 have to subtract that uh, baseline if you like. So that's a dark current that um, that is to do with uh, um, thermoelectrons generated in the detector. And then you may want to, if you're looking at an area that's sufficiently large, then you may need to calibrate the inhomogeneities of illumination, spatial inhomogeneity of the illumination, and also potential vignetting by your optical system if it's not perfect. And uh, you should then image a smooth white target for that. And then, of course, you have to do spectral reflectance calibration. So you need to image a wide standard with known spectral reflectance to use that to compare and work out what spectral reflectance is for your sun, uh, for your object. And uh, if you're using the grating-based system with uh, different bits of optics, uh, the, great, uh, the, the, the grating that disperses light, you need, uh, and sometimes because of temperature change movements, that could potentially change your wavelength calibration. And it's always good to calibrate your system when you arrive somewhere for your field application institute application and usually you use these standard lamps like mercury argon you know whatever that have these uh, standard transition lines you know what the wavelengths they are and you use that to calibrate your system so that's what you need to do right so what does visible near infrared spectral imaging give us it gives us of course spectral reflectance per pixel after calibration it also, if you're going, for example, in this case, 480 nanometers, it gives you the infrared image that reveals underdrawing, for example. And the other thing is that it gives you the color image, the most accurate color image for free. And you can simulate with the, the color image for any illumination conditions, which you cannot do with a color RGB camera accurately. So reflectance spectra multiplied by the spectrum of illuminant 
and multiply the color matching function of a standard observer. Um, and then if you integrate all that for each uh, um, of the blue, green, and red response, you can put it together in the three channels and you get your color image. Okay, so you can do this calculation very easily to get the color image as well. Right, and I just want to also show you one other thing you can get for free. And this is an instrument we de developed in the lab, which is a remote 3D spectral imaging system we call PRISMS. Um, so it's, it can operate on the ground uh, and it can give you spatial resolution about uh, just below 100 microns um, um, from 10 meters. Okay. And we, we do it like what astronomers do. Um, I used to be one. <laughs> and uh, so you have a telescope and you have illumination and the whole system is automated. It scans, it can scan a big painting, it can scan an entire ceiling or even the entire uh, wall painting if you want. And uh, then you can gather again, the, you know, in this case, we decided to sacrifice spectral resolution. So spectral resolution is about 50 nanometers. So we have 10 band, um, but we didn't sacrifice spatial resolution. Um, and but you can also sacrifice spatial resolution speed up. If you're looking at a really large, uh, you know, entire structure, you can lower it and speed it up again. And what's good about this is that um, it can give you very uh, good, you know, almost as good as laser scanning, the uh, 3D positions, because you have to focus when you image. Once you focus, you know where the fo uh, focus position is, you know where the object is. So you can work out an object, you know how far away it is. And of course, you know which direction you're looking at, so you can even generate a 3D point cloud of the ceiling here, okay? And of course, each pixel gives you the spectrum. In this case, it's uh, identified with indigo reference. Okay, so, so that's another thing you can get for free, 3D information as well. Now, um, since uh, uh, Rocco asked me to uh, say that this, uh, this time, uh, the summer school is all about collections. So I didn't want to focus too much about monuments and sites. And so there is a relevance. Uh, this PRISM system can be also used uh, for very convenient in situ imaging of paintings in galleries. Here it is uh, in the Nottingham Castle Museum and Gallery. We put the system there and we say, OK, to the curator, which painting do you want? And they say, OK, we want that one. Oh, I want this one. I said, OK, off we go. So we automatically we can autofocus uh, uh, automatically scan the whole painting here um, and uh, and uh, we have our lighting uh, there our own lighting but our lighting is um, um, we, we found that actually um, these uh, natural light if we switch off the gallery lights and just have the natural light it doesn't uh, you know it, it doesn't really affect our data collection so much it can work uh, and under and natural light but of course we are in England uh, it's not very bright. <laughs> but on the other hand, we do have a new system which can correct for um, uh, background light as well. Um, so therefore, the system is convenient because there's no size limitation on the painting scanned and you can put it uh, in the middle of the gallery. And uh, in our case, uh, because it's a regional uh, gallery, there's not that many visitors and we were there doing the visitors are coming in and going as well. So that was a uh, that was convenient. OK, and all our systems are also modular um, so that we can either look at something small, close by or even microscopic, or we can look at something far away. And there are different wavelengths involved uh, from 400 nanometer to all the way to 2500 nanometers. And so the different systems here, uh, you see some for local, some for you know, with a telescope for distance measurements um, uh, for inaccessible paintings or large paintings. OK, and uh, so that makes it very uh, convenient and we have the same software that drives it still. And just to give you some examples now, 
So here is an example of revealing hidden drawing. Remember I told you that I want to show off how it is that we went to New Zealand. That's a proof. <laughs> so they have the one and only medieval manuscript in New Zealand and they prize it very much in the uh, University of Canterbury. And uh, um, it's a genealogy role of uh, English uh, kings and queens. At the top of it, you know, there is this rose. And, uh, you know, we... <laughs> We image it, for example, and this is what you see in the near infrared. Um, you, you don't see much more there, but if we process the uh, spectral imaging cube using independent component analysis, which is very similar to principal component analysis the previous speaker uh, talked about, um, you can actually separate information out. This is presumably an earlier layer where it shows a Noah's Ark. Ah, so then now the historians know this is a Noah roll, yeah? And this is the covering up with the rows later on. So we were able to separate them using independent component analysis. And of course, they do a digital edition of Canterbury Row, and it is our hope to put scientific image into that as well. So this is, um, so, so we contributed to a module on digital humanity and heritage science research infrastructure with Patenos and collaboration with IRIS for this. And uh, it can also reveal faded writings to help, for example, um, historians to figure out, you know, what this painting is about or what, what this uh, the, uh, manuscript is about. In this case, it's actually a sheet of paper with prayers written on it and stuck onto a ceiling of a wall painting. And if you look at each individual spectral band, you see nothing. After we do PCA processing and independent component ICA processing, we see Sanskrit writing. And that has been very useful um, in the dating of the painting, which I'm going to tell you about later. And uh, uh, so we can also uh, do material identification if we have reflectance. So in this case, this painting here, uh, the black crosses are the uh, spectrum from our 10 band spectral imaging device. And the red is a reference spectrum from lapis lazuli, so that allows us to identify with lapis lazuli um, using spectral imaging. And I often hear people say that once you have mixtures, uh, reflecting spectroscopy is useless. And I would like to say that is not true. <laughs> and uh, uh, you can uh, um, you can see ah sorry. You can see that in this case you have a, a mock-up painted with red earth and azurite. Um, so they're mixed together and the mixture is painted, uh, we also measured, so we measure the, the, uh, the individual ones and the mixture. So the green is a mixture and the black dotted one is a Quebecer monk fit to, uh, by saying, if I were to mix this pigment with this pigment to fit this, would it fit or not? What's the best fit? And if that you can find a back fit with a correct uh, uh, the concentration of these two to match that, then we say it is likely to be identification. So in this case, they fitted well, for example. So this is a mock-up, we know it, and it worked. So Copaca Monk is a kind of uh, a model based, uh, you know, a simplified uh, radiation uh, uh, transport model, uh, if you like. and. Uh, um, and I, I talked about this in my review article that I talked about earlier on, that you can see. Um, and uh, uh, for, uh, for, for um, uh, watercolor painting in this case, uh, we can also, of course, one modality is not enough to be sure sometimes, especially reflection spect uh, spectra. Um, the features are broad and sometimes it's not so uh, specific. So um, in this particular case, what we did was uh, we did micro Raman, we did XRF, uh, and with all this information together, we had a few hypotheses for what the mixture might be, and we can test these hypotheses using Quebec fit to the reflector spectrum. Okay, and uh, we think it is, for example, in this case, smart as a right lead white mixture. And that's uh, in here if you want to find out more. And uh, OK, so that's that. And uh, I was going to give you another example of what shortwave infrared um, spectral imaging can give you. Uh, and uh, you've heard something from uh, Rocco the other day already. Uh, but here 
what we did was apply it to monitoring the degradation of enamel. This is a, a PhD student collaboration between British Museum and us. So this is a Limoges enamel. And what, um, you know, Limoges enamel are known to degrade very badly. Um, and, uh, you know, th there's a lot of effort spent on understanding how it degrades. And it's generally thought that uh, hydration uh, moisture is one of the effects that uh, linked with uh, degradation. And so here what we did was uh, uh, looked under optical coherence tomography OCT system to see the structure of degradation to the glass or, uh, you know, in this case, we also see the delamination of the glass from the foil background. Um, this is the entire cube rendered with OCT. Uh, you probably heard a uh, talk from Pieter Tarkovsky uh, yesterday on OCT, so I hope you understand what you're looking at here now. Um, so, um, so what what we wanted to do is to see whether we see this correlation between hydration levels and structural degradation. And so, by doing uh, we imaged using um, uh, shortwave infrared hyperspectral imaging from 1 micron to 2.5 micron. So this is a typical spectrum you get from this. And we choose the uh, water absorption band. And uh, we measure some, something that uh, in astrophysics uh, spectroscopy people do all the time. That is, we measure what's called equivalent width. So you, this is equivalent with in the sense that that's a continuum level. OK, this is a continuum level. OK, these are the continuum levels and you have the absorption band and the area under that. If you were to put it under the same continuum band, what is the width? So this is equivalent width and it's in units of nanometers. And so the higher that is, the more hydrated it is. And this is a hydration map of the enamel here. And that tells you which bit of the enamel is more hydrated, and we correlate that with our OCT uh, structural image, and we find there's a strong correlation between the two. And uh, so that's also uh, something quite uh, um, quite interesting to be able to see that. And this can be used as a quick method to survey collection in order to see how they are, you know, which ones need needs a tender loving care and stored in uh, well controlled conditions uh, by doing uh, shortwave infrared hyperspectral imaging of the enamels. And another thing is that we can also do layer by layer material characterization uh, by combining OCT with spectral imaging. And this is another PhD student project with the National Gallery. And the idea is to use OCT to help with uh, cleaning of varnish. But unfortunately, in the OCT image, varnish layer is semi-transparent, so are glaze layers. So how do you distinguish between the two? So um, we came up with this device where uh, Patrick had uh, developed that is using a super continuum laser and a tunable feature in front of it to illuminate the surface and to get the spectral imaging image. So this is, uh, you know, the wavelength selection on the illumination side, okay? At the same time, the OCT is still the same. You have the OCT that would give you uh, the structural information um, in the virtual cross sections, if you like. So by getting the information, so you can end up with a map of the thickness of this top layer, transparent layer, and for each pixel here, you have a thickness of that layer as well as spectra. And you can then work it out the, the uh, spectrum for the transparent layer. And in this case, it gives you a spectrum consistent with yellow varnish, so you know you can go ahead and clean it. Um, so that's that's another new development uh, we've uh, we've done. And now I want to come to the data data analysis part. Um, so we do large scale material survey of wall paintings was uh, what brought us to this. Um, we did this work at uh, the UNESCO site of Mughal Caves uh, in, along the Silk Road. And there was this particular cave that uh, um, uh, they wanted to know, they wanted to date it because uh, they don't know when over the 500 years it was painted. Um, and uh, it's interesting to find out the history of cultural encounter and also conservation condition survey. So we use a prism system to survey um, an entire ceiling, for example, and also to compare 
uh, with a number of other caves we, we surveyed and we compare the material to see in these caves we actually know the dates to see which one it corresponds to best. And that helped us with dating for material. And uh, by the way, when we talk about um, dating by material, we don't say just, okay, we found vermilion here. I mean, vermilion is everywhere. It's more about how they combine the pigments to make a color. That shows you something about the, the cultural influence and, uh, the, uh, and, and, the, and the times uh, in, in history in this case. So what, what we found is suddenly we have 5,000 image cubes. And now with the PhD of Sotiri Kuku, and uh, there's no way we can analyze it by hand, you know, normally anymore. And this is why we went into clustering using machine learning to help us to group all the pixels in the spectral cube that have the same spectra together in this false color. So everything green would have the same, more or less the same spectra. And then we can, um, uh, then it basically then reduces billions of spectra to 300 unique spectra. And now the 300 spectra, you can look at them and try to do your, your pigment identification and apply uh, complementary techniques to it to do multimodal spectroscopy to, to identify the pigments. And uh, by the way, the revealed uh, Sanskrit phrase was from this cave. And by doing um, uh, studying of the uh, paleography, we are able to date that as well. So the material dates and paleography dates match very well to allow us to date within 100 years, um, which was, uh, you know, if you're interested in that, a very interdisciplinary project you can read up on our 2020 paper. And finally, Luke. Butler, who is currently doing a PhD between us and the British Library, is further developing clustering uh, techniques in order to analyze, use the same sort of uh, idea to analyze the entire collection of manuscripts in you know, Southeast Asian man, uh, collection of uh, man illuminated manuscripts at the British Library. And uh, so he's able to cluster them together like this and then look at individually using different techniques to uh, identify them. So. And he looks at a different different islands here uh, in Southeast Asia. He had this many manuscripts, and uh, uh, of course, uh, in order to get reasonable resolution, he has to mosaic them to get them. And uh, so he has a big data problem, of course. Uh, so far, just with one week's uh, data collection, he has uh, more than a thousand spectral image cubes from the collection, and obviously, he needed to. Um, better his uh, uh, clustering algorithm to deal with that. What we found is that uh, he had to do a lot more work to improve the accuracy of uh, uh, the clustering because it's a different kind of data set compared to those wall paintings from uh, the Silk Road. And uh, so what he, uh, so we're still using the self-organizing maps, SOM, which is a shallow neural, neural network. Uh, it does competitive learning and it's unsupervised and we use it from the R package. So he has to write an a, a algorithm uh, that would uh, give the best result. And so basically in the end with all these manuscripts, he end up with a smaller number of distinct spectral groups with, with this mean spectrum for each cluster here. And uh, so the complete process, uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I have to hurry up. So the complete process is, of course, you do the normal processing of the data, you do the clustering, and there, there are different steps in the clustering. You and, have just uh, three you minutes know, left. If, uh, yes, sorry? You have just three minutes left. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I will hurry and, uh, and you can then, once you've got your cluster map for each cluster, you need to do uh, complementary uh, spectroscopy to identify the pigments, of course. Um, and then you can do further merging if you like, if, if all you need is a pigment ID. Um, but otherwise, they still care about not just spectra shape, but the intensity of the spectra as well. So that's what we do, because sometimes you do care. Um, and so before clustering one billion spectra, after clustering one thousand, uh, spectra, unique spectra, and uh, and then um, then we decided to look at this shape because this shape we know from our experience is probably indigo plus something uh, because it's green indigo plus a yellow pigment probably. So he's looking for everything that looks like this and uh, um, merge them together because all we care at this point is pigment ID, and so that can further reduce the one thousand clusters. 
And then we can look at them and try to do Kuiper Cup mark uh, fitting. So we got a, a very good uh, fit uh, with all pigment uh, and, uh, and indigo. Sometimes there's a bit of Rialga because they're naturally occurring together anyway. So, but of course, another yellow pigment could be Gamboge. So what you know, we need another technique, XRF. Tells us is there is arsenic, so we know we can be sure these are the combinations. So when you look at that. We can see that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, 11 clusters that can merge together to have that kind of uh, uh, opium plus uh, indigo mix here that you find from different uh, pages of different manuscripts and so on. And uh, uh, so now all these steps are automated um, because uh, SOM is um, unsupervised, so you don't need labeling like deep learning would need, and supervised any supervised technique would need labeling. Here, the data learns from itself um, to work it out. And uh, so, one of the interesting discoveries uh, Luke had was that these are the manuscripts he had. These are the ones that had this, the the mixture of indigo plus or pigment. The rest are all copper-based greens. So um, it seems that Java is special. They tend to mix indigo with or pigment. So that's already telling us something. This is the 18th, 19th century, telling us about possibly you would have to dig into the history and why it is that Java is special. What are the outside influences? What are the mineral deposits, etc. We can study that, certainly. OK. Finally, we can do multimodal clustering, as some of the speakers before me had already suggested. So here we choose, um, uh, it's a collaboration with a, with a Getty, um, and then looking at, uh, say, a watercolor painting, and we do uh, XRF mapping and uh, spectral imaging. And we can um, um, see how we might do clustering for both and put them together. So first of all, we do the XRF uh, uh, clustering. So uh, we have to do some automatic pre-processing to extract the channels with information, that is with the lines, uh, rather than just noise on the counts. And uh, uh, then we put that together. So this is, uh, if you want to look in the detail, you can look at this paper here. Um, so you can, you can put it together. And uh, now you can cluster them in the same way as we did before uh, with spectral imaging, and you get a false color cluster map. So all these same colors are uh, sharing the same uh, XRF spectrum. Okay. And uh, so when we do multi model clustering, what we can do is that we have to, first of all, uh, match the reflectance spectra uh, cube to the same, uh, uh, to reshape it to uh, the same, um, uh, align it with the XRF data cube. So each pixel corresponds to each other then. Um, so then we can do the, uh, so we we look at the, the false color composite uh, uh, cluster maps for reflectance spectroscopy. Um, uh, so for, for uh, uh, reflectance of spectral imaging cube and for XRF cube. And uh, we can now, combine them in a multimodal way so that we can combine them. And this is our final uh, false color multimodal cluster map. And uh, by doing that, it makes the clustering much more accurate as well. And uh, I'll show you examples where one particular modality fails. So for example, for, for XRF uh, cluster map here, uh, this is a single cluster, cluster 39, so all the white bits are the pixels that belong to the cluster. But if instead of doing this, you allow the, these pixels to have their original color, immediately you see that there is difference in material. But the X, XRF spectra is identical. That tells you there must be some organics that make them different uh, here. That, uh, that you see with the reflection spectra, they're different, but even in color they're different, so you, you know. So that's the reason why XRF put them together. And, uh, but after multimodal clustering, it's able to separate them into three clusters. What was one cluster in XRF? And similarly, hope, hope you're you know, the opposite into problem. the conclusion. Yeah, Aida. okay, I, I'm coming to that. Yeah, 
you have the same issues, so I, I'm not going to go into that. And uh, finally, we are developing the, uh, the app that is going to be shared with everyone that allows you to look at uh, the clusters and uh, in different ways, uh, uh, different cluster maps and so on. And uh, uh, just to advertise a bit, because I know Jana likes us doing that, that is uh, uh, you can access uh, to some of the spectral imaging systems that uh, I talked about, not just in my group, which is mostly remote based, um, uh, remote sensing MOLAB, and uh, also in the close range ones in the multi hyperspectral imaging uh, tab. So you should look both, look at both to see which one suits your application best. And, uh, and you can also directly access uh, with uh, Isaac Mobile Lab if you wish. And uh, you can go to our website, find out everything about it. We also have an airborne remote spectral imaging, hyperspectral imaging with LiDAR. And thank you for your attention. And this is, this is thank it. Thank you. Thank you, Ida. Uh, thank you. It was really a very 